morning of March 20th, 1995, began like any other on the Tokyo Metro. Thousands of commuters gathered to board the crowded trains that connected to several government buildings as well as the National Police headquarters. Then, bodies suddenly began to drop. People started collapsing as they unknowingly inhaled sarin gas that had been released into the subway. In total, 12 died while thousands sustained injuries from the nerve agent. In total, 12 died while thousands sustained injuries from the nerve agent that would scar them for the rest of their lives. In retrospect, the attack could have been much worse. Police discovered that the sarin, left in bags at various underground drop points, had been hastily prepared. At a higher concentration, though, its effects could have been absolutely devastating. Still, the 1995 sarin incident remains one of the deadliest attacks on Japanese soil since World War II, and its perpetrators were members of the new religious movement that we'll be analyzing today, Aum Shinrikyo. I'm Michael Albany. And I'm Patrick Reynolds. Today's episode of Sex Ed will be a little more serious than some in the recent past because we're going to be talking about a group that's perpetrated what can only be described as terrorist acts. Now, we're certainly no strangers to some violent history on Sex Ed. You recall that in episode 4 we covered the infamous UFO religion Heaven's Gate, and in episode 6 and 7 we examined some religious groups in the French Revolution whose members committed a quite staggering amount of murders. However, Om Shinrikyo remains somewhat unique because, well, Heaven's Gate's violence was exclusively self-inflicted, and members of the Cult of Reason and the Supreme Being were killing as part of a political strategy. Om Shinrikyo was a non-state body that assaulted civilian populations. Still, on this show, we don't want topics of murder and terrorism to completely overtake the conversation. The brief introduction that Michael just gave, for example, will be our only real major reference to what will eventually become known as the Alm Incident. There are several other compelling podcasts and documentaries that cover it in great detail about the crime and the murder and the terrorism. Um, and it's going to be an unavoidable topic at times when we're talking about it. But what we're most interested today in is uh, often something that gets drowned out in discussions of Om Shinrikyo. Namely, we want to take a look at what Om Shinrikyo actually believed in and what kinds of people joined them and why and how the violence became one of their defining features. So now in order to address that first point, what Om Shinrikyo believed, we have to dig into the background of their founder, Shoko Asahara. Shoko Asahara was born on March 2nd, 1955, under the name Chizuo Matsumoto on the island of Kyushu. He was one of seven children born into a poor family, and he couldn't see out of one of his eyes. Uh, he had 30% vision in his other eye, but at the age of six, his parents still sent him to a boarding school for blind children, which would prove a transformative experience. Being sent away instilled Asahara with a sense of abandonment that he'd carry with him for the rest of his life. While he would later change his name for religious reasons, it's pretty clear that he also had a personal stake in adopting a name he chose for himself. He was resentful towards his parents and channeled that resentful energy into several ambitious ventures that for various reasons were not always successful. After 14 years in boarding school, for example, he tried to pursue a career in medicine, but the local university wouldn't make accommodations for students with vision impairments. Dejected, Asahara moved to Tokyo to practice acupuncture and Japanese folk medicine, and this could very well be considered the flashpoint of his religious evolution. Asahara's parents uh, were Pure Land Buddhists, so he was raised to follow various Buddhist customs and rituals, but he considered these too formulaic. Thus, when he struck out on his own, he started engaging in a lot of religious experimentation with everything from Taoism to divination until he eventually uh, encountered Agen Shō. Agen Shō was one of the Shinshin Shukyo, or new, new religions, that emerged in Japan in the late 1970s. Since the end of World War II, Japan had in fact witnessed the rise of many new religions, often in response to periods of great social tension. The late 1970s and 1980s represented one of those periods. Japan's economy was on a meteoric rise, but as more people identified themselves as comfortably middle class, younger generations especially began to question the purpose of their lives and turn towards more spiritual practices. Asahara found Egan Shu in 1981, and they influenced his worldview in several important ways. They stressed the importance of karuma ukiru, or cutting karma, and you'll want to keep the concept of karma in mind because it'll return a lot throughout our story. Asahara also learned Mikio, the esoteric Buddhism that Egan Shu's founder, Asahara also learned about Mikiyu, the esoteric Buddhism that Egan Shu's founder, Seiyu Kiriyama, had promoted. And he started acquiring a growing interest in psychic and supernatural powers. Additionally, Asahara became acquainted with yoga and finally left Egan Shu in 1984 to master this art. 
The next year, readers of the New Age magazine Twilight Zone were amazed when they opened its pages to discover a picture of Asahara seemingly levitating. The publicity the photo generated drove many curious people to join his newly formed yoga group, Om Sensei no Kai, or the Om Group of Mountain Aesthetics. Now, this group of mountain aesthetics wouldn't remain a simple yoga group for long. Over the next couple of years, Asahara claimed to experience a variety of miraculous spiritual encounters. At one point, he traveled to India with the intention of practicing under a famous yoga master, uh, but he soon became disillusioned with this master and left to practice by himself. And while he was practicing, uh, for only two months, he claimed to have attained enlightenment. He said that he achieved, quote, a state of absolute freedom, happiness, and joy, where one's suffering is extinguished and the cycle of life and death is transcended. He also claimed that he met the Hindu god Shiva. While praying, he said that Shiva appeared to him and anointed him Abhiraketso no Mikoro. A title Asahara explained meant the god of light who leads the armies of the gods. In 1987, Aum Shinsen no Kai became Aum Shinrikyo, or Aum Teaching of Absolute Truth. Asahara, that is the man we've been calling Asahara, also officially changed his name. Uh, up to this point, he'd still been going by Chizuo Matsumoto, but with Aum Shinrikyo now a formally religious group, uh, he chose a new name, spelled with Chinese characters that supposedly brought good luck. Now, explaining what Om Shinrikyo believed doctrinally is a bit difficult, because as you may have guessed from our story so far, Asahara had this tendency to study all sorts of different religions and traditions, and then continually incorporate the things he liked, and then abandon the things he didn't like. And so what we're left with then is this odd assortment of seemingly contradictory philosophies, with Asahara really being the only main glue binding them all together. So, for example, when Om Shinrikyo began, it preached strict adherence to Hinayana Buddhism, claiming that it was the oldest Buddhist tradition and closest to the teachings of the original Buddha. Therefore, it was also the purest. By 1989, though, Asahara backtracked and started to teach Mahayana Buddhism. The reason he likely did this is because Mahayana Buddhism places a greater emphasis on the importance of personal suffering. For most branches of Buddhism, the ultimate goal is to achieve nirvana, the state where you're finally able to break free from the universe's physical, constant cycle of death and rebirth. In Mahayana Buddhism, though, there's an even higher ideal than becoming a bodhisattva. A bodhisattva is a person who is spiritually pure enough to achieve nirvana, but chooses then to take on the suffering of others in order to help them achieve nirvana. And that suffering is often the result of bad karma. In order to combat bad karma, members of Om Shinrikyo needed to complete what Asahara called his four stages of entering the stream. For the sake of time, we won't go into all four stages here, but instead direct you to check out the blog post we'll be putting on our website, www.sectz.com. Suffice it to say, being in Om Shinrikyo involved a lot of really intense instruction. This invites the question, though, what kind of people joined Om Shinrikyo anyway? Surprisingly, a majority of people who joined Om Shinrikyo were young people in their late teens and early 20s. To understand why, we again have to remember what Japan as a whole was going through in the 1980s. With the economy on the rise, personal success began to be defined more and more by economic advancement and acquiring material wealth. Many middle-class Japanese parents expected their children uh, to get the best test scores in high school so they could go to the best universities so they could get the best jobs. And this path left many young people disillusioned. This was compounded by the prevalence of ijime, or bullying, in Japanese schools. Many students felt that material wealth wasn't worth all the pressure they faced at home and in the classroom, so they looked to orders that could help them foster their spiritual well-being. Enter Shoko Asahara. Now, when we discuss reasons why people joined Aum Shinrikyo, we can't overlook the charisma of its founder. Uh, we're talking about a man who was so magnetic that he even garnered the attention of the Dalai Lama. During a 1987 visit uh, with the Tibetan leader in exile, the Dalai Lama allegedly said to Asahara, quote, Dear friend, look at the Buddhism of Japan today. It, was de it has degenerated into ceremonialism and has lost the essential truth of the teachings. As the situation continues, Buddhism will vanish from Japan. Something needs to be done, and you should spread real Buddhism there. You can do that well. Now, this quotation comes from an Aum Shinrikyo publication, so uh, you should certainly take it with a grain of salt. But the fact that Asahara apparently earned an audience with the Dalai Lama at all demonstrates his drive and persuasiveness. I also think it's really interesting, too, that um, the way that Aum Shinrikyo was structured 
internally was really, really similar to the Japanese school system, that you had levels, that you had tests, mm -hmm. that you had to advance and, and sort of earn points to get your way up this, this uh, ladder. So that for the, the young people coming out of the Japanese school system, there was that element of familiarity, too, where it's, okay, well, now I can still keep studying, I can keep advancing. But the studying that we're doing in Om Shinrikyo was spiritual in nature, quote-unquote. Uh, and it was, it was I'm going to keep on with my schooling, but on a different track than what all the uh, students who bullied me perhaps are doing on their, their more materialistic track of, of getting jobs and careers and going to college. Asahara used his persuasiveness to actively recruit Japanese teenagers while also exploiting the pop culture of the day. Om Shinrikyo owned a publishing house that released not only magazines, but manga and anime, so that's comics and animated films. We'll be sure to provide a link to the anime clip in the show notes on our website because these things are, uh, definitely need to be seen to be believed. They often depict Asahara as this toned figure with no evidence of his visual impairment, and he could astral project and use all these other extraordinary powers, which was in keeping in line with his public image. Um, remember one of Asahara's earliest claims to fame was that he could allegedly levitate, which he assured Um Shinrikyo members that they could also do uh, if they unlocked their potential to do it. This genuinely appealed to young people who shared a growing fascination with the supernatural and the occult. Still, another group that made up the base of Om Shinrikyo's converts were scientists. And we'll elaborate on why Asahara specifically sought out scientists to join his sect, but moving into the 1990s, Om Shinrikyo began to brand itself as a scientific refuge. The expanding Japanese economy we've mentioned several times was a bubble that finally burst in their economy in 1991. This left few enticing job opportunities for graduate students in the sciences. Basically, if they were smart but still pretty far from the top of their class, the best they could hope for was a corporate job where they'd be given very little freedom to pursue the research that they were passionate about. Asahara offered these people substantial financial resources and the ability to research whatever they wanted so long as they put, also put their mind to work on own related projects. Through recruitment tactics like these, Aum Shinrikyo was able to grow swiftly, but not without controversy. Uh, as you might expect, as young people flocked to Asahara's sect, their parents began raising objections. After all, joining Aum Shinrikyo entailed several significant lifestyle changes. First, members had to embrace a system called shuke, meaning that they had to live celibate lives dedicated solely to spiritual growth. In fact, the highest level members of Aum Shinrikyo were called renunciants, and these were the people who were willing to surrender all of their worldly possessions to the group and live communally, while those at lower levels uh, simply met at various meeting centers established throughout Japan. Additionally, by 1988, Aum Shinrikyo's aesthetic training regimen became even more rigorous. It was uh, that year that Asahara and members of his inner circle started using physical violence to punish members that they viewed as lax in their training. Now, many people who've written about Asahara since the 1990s have highlighted this uh, as evidence of his megalomaniacal nature. They pointed uh, to the fact that when Asahara was in boarding school, uh, he frequently got into fights, and he was really something of a bully while he was there. And that's usually how they sort of uh, uh, portray him as just an inherently violent person. Uh, so one question to consider is, why did Aum Shinrikyo members at the time put up with this behavior, put up with basically being beaten up? The answer lies in the fact that in the late 1980s, Aum Shinrikyo was undergoing another theological transformation. More and more, Asahara began emphasizing his role as a supreme guru, and following his orders and teachings specifically became a more important component of eventually attaining enlightenment. Uh, that's perhaps why when you read interviews with former Aum Shinrikyo members, they frequently characterize Asahara uh, as fierce but simultaneously gentle. Nevertheless, this dangerous practice of uh, using physical violence on quote-unquote lax trainees uh, in these spiritual activities invertly led to one of its members' deaths. So at this point, we have to start delving into some of the murders and other horrific abuses that senior Aum Shinrikyo members were committing because they were, in many cases, theologically motivated. In 1989, Aum Shinrikyo was being reviewed by the Japanese government for formal recognition as a religion, and Asahara and his inner circle really wanted to make sure that nothing would jeopardize their chances. Uh, when a man named Shuji Taguchi threatened to leave the group and expose the manslaughter that had occurred uh, during one of their previous September quote-unquote training exercises, uh, a senior member strangled him to death in order to ensure his silence. In late 1989, the sect also targeted a lawyer named Satsumi Sakamoto, who represented several parents of Aum Shinrikyo members trying to sue the group. 
A team of senior members broke into Satsumoto's apartment one night and killed him, his wife, and their infant child and buried their bodies in the nearby mountains. Now one would think that this would be a massive scandal. There's a lawyer who's been publicly vilifying Om Shinrikyo along with his wife and baby and they're all suddenly murdered, so why wouldn't Om Shinrikyo be prime suspects? As it happens, the Kanagawa Prefecture Police, who were in charge of the investigation, didn't care much for Sakamoto. Just one year prior, he had represented a member of the Communist Party who had sued the police department, so many scholars suggest that the officers didn't give the case the full attention it deserved. While many may have privately suspected Om Shinrikyo, the group faced no legal repercussions as they received official religious corporation status by the end of the year. With their status as a Japanese religion officially secured, what will come next for Om Shinrikyo? In 1990, the sect started laying the groundwork to enter the secular world of politics. A general election was scheduled for that February, and Aum Shinrikyo wanted to sweep into the lower house of Japan's bicameral legislature. They formed their own political party, called Shinrito, or the Party of Supreme Truth, and put forth 25 candidates for various seats. Asahara himself was one of these candidates. Now, the idea of religious leaders entering politics shouldn't sound shocking uh, to listeners who've been with us since the very beginning. In episode one of Sex Ed, we covered James Jesse Strang, the so-called King of Beaver Island, who was elected twice to Michigan's House of Representatives in the 1850s. Actually, let's pause for a moment here and revisit Strang's political career, because this was a Mormon man, a follower of a faith that many Americans were suspicious of and knew little about, But by the end of his two terms in office, one reporter in Detroit actually said of him, quote, Mr. Strang's course as a member of the present legislature has disarmed much of the prejudices which have previously surrounded him. Whatever may be said or thought of the peculiar sect of which he is the local head, I take pleasure in stating that throughout this session he has conducted himself with a degree of decorum and propriety which have been equaled by his industry, good temper, apparent regard for the true interests of the people, and the obligations of his official oath. Now, why is that quotation relevant to an analysis of Om Shinrikyo? Because it demonstrates an instance where a member of a religious minority was able to change the way people thought about him simply by conducting himself with a level of professionalism people expected from his office. Asahara and the other Shinrito candidates, uh, on the other hand, they were either unwilling or unable to do all of that. Another thing interesting about the election, um why they never tried it again um, is because a lot of it was was uh, a lot of their members were kept like locked down in their compounds that um, once they started sending them out into the general public to campaign to knock on doors they lost a lot of members people just left people were like oh there's a real world out here and I don't have to live in this sort of constructed uh, reality that the Asahara is controlling so pretty pretty intensely um, so they, they did lose a lot of members but then they bounced back Japan has a long tradition of having religions with political arms, such as Saka Gakkai, which probably deserves its own episode sometime in the future. Speaking of you know religions with political arms, up until you know World War II with the state Shintoism and, and the emperor worship, that was really central to Japanese politics. Um, was was a religious branch, and um, it also is it is important to think of all these new religious groups are emerging after World War II. Um, partly to fill a vacuum in that the emperor, uh, as, as part of their surrender in World War II, had to advocate his godhood. Um, he had to go on the radio and say, I'm not a god anymore, uh, whatever it was. And it created this, this sort of spiritual vacuum that uh, all sorts of people filled. And it definitely is important to keep in mind, as we mentioned, um, when we're talking about Om Shinrikyo, especially in the documentaries and, and things that talk about just the terrorist acts and the violence of... Um, it sort of raises the question of how did they go unnoticed? Well, they weren't unnoticed. They were one of a lot of new religious movements. They were well known, but they were not seen as dangerous. They were seen as sort of strange and and, um, some group to be somewhat wary of, but they didn't really press into into how far they had gone, essentially. Even among these groups, however, Om Shinrikyo and Shinrito stood out. Their candidates refused to wear suits, instead dressing in the white robes of their orders. They held bombastic rallies where their supporters danced around while wearing masks of the Hindu god Ganesha, which was something they got mocked for um, quite a lot. This simply was not the kind of behavior that Japanese voters expected from a serious political party. Additionally, Shinrita didn't have the massive base of Om Shinrikyo members to rely on. As we've mentioned several times how Om Shinrikyo's membership increased in the 1980s, it's important to keep in mind that they were always a relatively small sect with a peak membership of about 10,000 in 1994. 
In comparison, Egan Shu, the sect that Asahara left before founding Om Shinrikyo, boasted about 260,000 members. Uh, likely for all these reasons, all of Shinrito's candidates lost their elections disastrously. In fact, Asahara performed worst of all. In a constituency with approximately half a million people, he managed to earn less than 2,000 votes. It was a humiliating defeat that signaled the turning point for Om Shinrikyo. After this, an opportunity that they literally killed for, they became less interested in contemporary politics and focused more on the end of the world. As early as the 1980s, Asahara had become fascinated with the concept of Armageddon. Uh, he read the Book of Revelation from the New Testament and a Japanese translation of the prophecies of Nostradamus that had been circulating since the 1970s. And he started incorporating these elements into his teachings. Uh, but he held his first formal Armageddon seminar after Shinrito lost the 1990 elections. Uh, he claimed that the world was spiraling towards World War III, and that it would be a conflict between East and West, Buddhism and Christianity. Uh, and he meant this both figuratively and literally. Essentially, uh, there's sort of the literal conflict, the possibility of nuclear war or war with uh, massively advanced weapons, but there's also sort of that ideological and theological war, the idea that the West embodies uh, materialistic, worldly uh, endeavors, whereas the East embodies uh, the sort of spiritual endeavors that Asahara claimed to be the master of. And as they're, they're talking about the apocalypse, too, some of the, the abuses in their, their training were specifically tied into the apocalypse concept as well. So they, when um, there would be a lot of boiling water involved, but that would be to sort of raise their toughness, is how they said, so that they could survive all these apocalyptic things. They were starving people to say, this is, we're going to be used to starving once all the food's gone after the world's ended. Um, so they, they were really framing the Armageddon as something that only they would be able to survive, and that's what they were preparing for, was um, surviving it. Not just uh, preaching to the, the masses, essentially, of Ocean Rikyo, um, that there was definitely going to be an Armageddon that will survive um, in the top levels, it was how can we cause this Armageddon, uh, as we're going to see. So what can Aum Shinrikyo do about this impending Armageddon? First, Asahara said that their group needed more members, and they increased their recruitment efforts and actually found the greatest success internationally, in Russia of all places. So remember, we're talking about the years right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, a period of great unrest that Aum Shinrikyo had experienced thriving in. Uh, in Russia, especially after so many years of sort of state-sanctioned atheism, uh, in the 1990s, you started to see another vacuum emerge there of basically new spiritual forces coming in. Asahara actually had a contact within the Russian government, which is how he was able to get there. Uh, but if you look at the 1990s, you see uh, lots of other different religious groups, lots of other new religious movements trying to get a foothold there. One of them is uh, the Unification Church, or the Moonies, which we'll be sure to cover in the future. Um, now, in total, Aum Shinrikyo claimed to garner about 30,000 converts in Russia, but this is likely uh, a very inflated number. It's likely that they only had a couple hundred who actually embraced the renunciate life, that ideal life that Asahara wanted from his followers. Asahara also started to more openly embrace science and technology. Uh, while he initially ascribed to the belief that religion and science were fundamentally at odds with each other, Throughout the 1990s, he actively sought out young scientists for his movement. As we've already said, he offered them massive research stipends that were financed through various businesses that Aum Shinrikyo owned. Uh, they had computer stores throughout Tokyo and Osaka. Basically, they would buy computer parts, have Aum members construct the computers, and then be able to sell them very cheaply. Uh, they had a sheep farm in Australia. Uh, and uh, probably most substantial of all, they uh, had various, uh, various chemical companies that worked for them. So they were able to acquire uh, a variety of amounts of different chemicals, basically under the radar. It was basically simple for them to get different sorts of drugs and chemicals without raising suspicions. Which is important for Asahara because he's been on LSD this entire time, massive amounts, um, which tie into his visions that he, he keeps claiming to have. And in, this is really similar to Jonestown, as I think we'll go into more detail later, but um, this whole time Asahara is not at all practicing what he preaches. He is completely um, separate rules for him and, and the rules for his followers, where the things like the celibacy and the, um, 
the all vegetable diet, the vegetarian diet. Um, he's not sticking sticking to that even remotely, um, and he's doing quite a lot of drugs and uh, living a, a fairly lavish uh, lifestyle in some ways. Although once they start getting the chemical companies, then yeah, that's when it really yeah. once they get the chemical companies and the scientists who start working for them, this is where Ohm starts to use scientific uh, measures to try to advance sort of their spiritual training. So the use of hallucinogenic drugs in trying to spur on the attainment of enlightenment, their uh, various sort of electrical devices, sort of shock devices that uh, scientists create for the training purposes. So um, science Ohm uses on one hand to advance its spiritual mission, but then there's sort of a pragmatic element. Uh, that they have to it, because as Om Shinrikyo becomes more and more obsessed with the idea of an impending doomsday, um, they want to, number one, try to use uh, different spiritual practices to sort of understand the world a little bit better. Um, in one uh, paper that Om Shinrikyo scientists actually published, they claim uh, that they could use what Asahara called his yoga theory to prove the Big Bang Theory. Um, now, on the other hand, they also wanted to actually compile weapons themselves, which early on they talk about for defensive purposes. Remember, um, early on in the talk of Doomsday, uh, Aum Shinrikyo is setting itself up as this sort of refuge sect. It's going to be the one sect that once the end of the world comes, you're going to be safe being there. And part of being safe there means acquiring weapons and some of these weapons that the scientists are working on they go into sort of science fiction territory uh, there are claims of projects for things like time machines and death rays but then you have other things nuclear weapons and uh, most importantly of all chemical weapons an AK-47 factory they were trying to set up I'm not sure if it ever actually worked but um, yeah they were they were gathering guns and things like that, um, which were very hard to get in Japan with their very strict gun laws. Oh, and they were testing their chemical weapons on their sheep farm, on the sheep. The logical shift took place in Aum Shinriki around this time, too. After the abortive 1990 elections, Asahara added more and more esoteric elements to the Mahayana Buddhism that Aum Shinrikyo practiced, and lectured more and more about the Tibetan Buddhist philosophy of Poa. Now, poa is a word that's similar to jihad, in that jihad is an Arabic word that a lot of people sort of simplistically define to mean holy war, but it actually just means struggle. And that struggle could be personal or interpersonal, internal or external, and the range of things that, in, the range of things that it can encompass is very broad. Poa is a similarly broad term that Asahara simplifies to mean something along the lines of killing to save. Essentially, he taught that if people are engaged in acts that would bog them down with bad karma, you could kill someone to release their bad karma and absorb it for them, only it would still benefit you because it was a benevolent act. You're, you're stopping them from dropping down on the wheel of karma. Um, now, setting aside how theologically problematic this is, it was pragmatically problematic because senior Aum Shinrikyo members basically just used it to justify murdering anybody that they considered a threat to their order, uh, eventually going all the way up to their, their plans to actively create the apocalypse themselves, um, being sort of a poa for the whole world. Um, in June of 1994, for example, Aum Shinrikyo was locked in a court battle for a tract of land that they wanted to build a meeting center. When they heard that the judges weren't going to rule in their favor, several senior members drove a truck into the town of Matsumoto and released sarin gas that killed seven and injured 147. Much like in the previously discussed Sakamoto murder case, what largely spared Aum Shinrikyo from legal consequences, were the actions of the local police who focused their investigation on an innocent bystander whose wife was put into a coma by the attack. This was the first ever chemical attack on a civilian population by a non-state body, and the tragedy was overshadowed by the great Hanshin earthquake the next year that killed over 5,000. Natural disasters like this, however, strengthened Asahara's resolve that the Armageddon was quickly approaching. Moving into 1995, he became more and more reserved, avoiding eye contact with all but his inner circle. In reality, he was contemplating how Aum Shinrikyo could engage in a massive act of POA, instigating World War III and destroying the world so they could save it. One other important thing to bring up here is the fact of, uh, we have the natural disaster that occurs, the Great Hanshin Earthquake. And this is something that Asahara claimed that he had predicted, um, and this kind of goes in line uh, with another thing he claimed, the fact that he actually had superpower, that he, that he actually had supernatural powers. Oh, uh, yeah, that was 
that, that was a huge part of, of join me and you can get these superpowers too. Now we've got levitation, obviously, but he also claimed to have the sort of power of seeing into the future. He had the power of divination that he could sort of see incoming events. And this was something that is a massive theme in Alan Shinrikyo publications. The fact that he said, you know, uh, by 19, like by the nineties, the Japanese economy is going to go downhill. Uh, and by, uh, sometime between 1999 and 2003, I believe, uh, he said this was going to be the window wherein the end of the world is coming. And uh, as we see now, um, it's not a thing that they decide to wait for. It's something they decide to personally instigate. The vast majority of the people in Ocean Rikyo, while this was going on, didn't know about it. There were so many different levels of uh, the, the organization that you had to get to this level and pass this thing to get to the um, to know this or that. So, like ninety percent of the people in Ocean Rikyo had no idea that these attacks or these murders were going on at all. Um, and if they were told, as we'll see later, they have a hard time even believing it. The 1995 Tokyo Metro incident was not that massive act. In fact, Om Shinrikyo had actually purchased a helicopter from Russia that they planned to use uh, in a much larger assault that coming November. The subway attack, though, did usher in the end of Asahara as Om Shinrikyo's leader. Police raided Om Shinrikyo meeting centers and facilities and arrested many senior members. Asahara was sentenced to death in 2004 for uh, masterminding a variety of uh, murders and heinous acts that Om Shinrikyo had perpetrated, uh, but his penalty was postponed in 2012 after more Om Shinrikyo fugitives were apprehended. Were apprehended. Now, throughout this episode, we tried to be cognizant in pointing out that most of Om Shinrikyo's criminal activity was concentrated in the top of the hierarchy. As we've said, Om Shinrikyo is a very hierarchical organization wherein uh, Asahara was at the very top, and then you had to go through a variety of different uh, examinations and training exercises in order to move up it. And Asahara, in fact, he controlled all of the flow of information. So while he was able to uh, get all the information that was at the bottom of the hierarchy, he didn't let it move downward. Many members were completely unaware of these more horrific activities Asahara's inner circle was engaged in. We bring this up because the common media response in the 1990s was to simply label Aum Shinrikyo as this evil cult made up of these crazy cult members. And what you've hopefully gathered throughout this episode is that it's a little more complicated than that. A majority of Aum Shinrikyo's members were young people, disillusioned with the materialism of the world around them, seeking spiritual well-being. And the various established traditions they studied, everything from Buddhism to Christianity, uh, they didn't need to result in as much violence as they did. Something that a lot of Something that a lot of scholars point to is that at such young ages, senior Aum Shinrikyo members uh, had still yet to become what are known in Japan as Sakai Jin, that is, persons of society, people who have matured beyond the carefree life of young people and learned to behave according to society's rules. Looking back, most of the murders senior Aum Shinrikyo members committed, they were directed towards people who publicly criticized and threatened the order that these members admired so much. So they may have simply been unable to deal with uh, all of this criticism against what they basically took as the center of their universe. They couldn't take it diplomatically, especially when you add Shoko Asahara into the mix. Uh, and he provided them with the theological justification to escalate their violence, as well as, in many cases, planning it out himself. Asahara, he's really the linchpin of this organization. When you add in negligent police investigations that might have stopped Asahara sooner, you have this equation that unfortunately uh, and ultimately equals disaster. Surprisingly, Aum Shinrikyo still exists today as two distinct entities. There's Aleph, which Aum Shinrikyo changed his name to, and uh, Hikari no Wa, which splintered off from the main group in 2007 after completely denouncing Asahara. The Japanese government continues to monitor both of these groups, though. Um, so before we conclude, do we have any final thoughts? Definitely. I mean, this this is a, a group that really, really revolves around Asahara, where we've, we've looked at a lot of other groups where, I mean, 
things like the, the shakers are, are probably as far from them as you can get uh, in a lot of ways. But they, they go on after their leader is gone that they definitely have a very strong presence of the founder, but that's not controlling everything that they're about. But this one definitely is more that it, it fits the, uh, the sort of traditional media narrative of a, of a cult um, more than a lot of the other groups we covered because there, it is so cynical on his part. He is um, There is the whole just outright criminal element of it where it's a criminal organization and a religious organization. Um, they, they, I mean, they're like selling speed. They have uh, one of the largest drug factories in the world at one point. Very dangerous. <laughs> yeah, um, and it definitely it reminds me a lot of Jonestown, um, especially with their Nostradamus and their, their apocalypse fixations and their um, very megalomaniacal leader uh, on an increasingly heavy drug diet. Um, and I think the parallel is even more compelling there when you get into the idea that the sort of cornerstones of the theology are nothing really too radical in the sense that they're completely moving away from things that are already established. All, like all of Om Shinrikyo's practices, they're based in various traditions, but Asahara just had this tendency to just make it all about him <laughs> create a hodgepodge yeah. of things and ultimately find a way to put him at the center of it um and jonestown was kind of like that as well and i think it'll be compelling to look at that later and do a comparison between the two you mentioned sort of a uh disbelief in the fact that there's a splinter group from Aum Shinrikyo that comes so recently 2007 yeah it took um, a while and one of the reasons that that happens is because um the way Aum Shinrikyo is set up, it's supposed to have this one central uh, leader, this guru, the head of everything. And they're actually, there's this one individual who does emerge. He was amongst uh, Asahara's inner circle. He's actually arrested, but uh, in the late 90s, he is released. And after many years, he starts to think, okay, we need to take this group and move it away. And so he sort of takes the lead, and that becomes Hikari no Wa. And because he has this connection to Asahara, he has this sort of legitimacy to do so. And I guess we could talk more about the, the Hindu elements, because they seem very surface level. Um, Obviously, karma being a, a big element, but that's part of Buddhism as well. So that it yeah, the sense- really more based on. But they use sort of the the Hindu iconography a little bit, and it doesn't seem to go further beyond that. They really like Shiva. They really like the Destroyer and the um, sort of apocalyptic elements from Hinduism. Um, and they again with their their connection to Christianity, they seem basically just to like the Book of Revelations, and they like the destruction, and they like the apocalypse, and that's. That seems to be mostly what they get as they're mod podging together all these different religions is is the destructive parts. So the guy who who starts Hikari no Wa, his name's uh, Fumihoro Joyu, and he is one of these members of Asahara's inner circle who is incarcerated, um, and then he's released, and he starts this splinter group. And one of the uh, interesting little tidbits about him is he was actually one of the 25 candidates who was part of the 1990 election, and he was actually going up for a seat in the same constituency as Asahara, and he actually got more votes than Asahara. So you basically have a subservient member getting more votes in that election than the head of the entire organization, which I think compounds... It's probably more relatable to the normal person out there voting. It sort of compounds, though, how humiliating that was. But, yeah, I, I think the Hinduism is uh, is also an interesting sort of thing. Um, the main takeaway that I found in sort of researching the theology, the main takeaway from Hinduism is Shiva itself. Basically, while Aum Shinrikyo does not have a god, you can think of Shiva as sort of a... It's sort of an object of worship. Shiva is the main object of worship and the fact that Shiva is a Hindu god which sort of embodies chaos and destruction in a way is something that and uh, yeah destruction I mean in a cycle of you know things will be rebuilt so it's not a everyone's dead apocalypse it's a clearing so that the world can be remade Mm -hmm. which definitely is in line with what they were thinking they were doing or what Asahara at least claimed that they were doing yes 
and I guess we could talk a bit more about um, just the media's relationship to him because he was really well known as just like an appearance for his appearances just on talk shows. He was like there's there's clips online you can find we'll probably post some um, where he's on these these various Japanese talk shows and like people are just laughing at him. He's he's like a joke in a lot of ways where. Um, some talk show host will be asking him this or that, and he'll he'll be saying his you know philosophy and preaching about uh, anti-materialist uh, is, is usually what he starts talking about, and he'll show off some of his superpowers, and you can literally just hear the crowd laughing at him. Most people were like, "This guy's he's just a funny weirdo that we're laughing at," um, and he didn't seem to mind that. Um, he just he had he had this very long-standing media presence. And that's really one of the main things that he capitalizes on, is the fact that um, that's one of the reasons Aum Shinrikyo can get the number of followers that it does, because he sort, of, he sort of understands what the public likes. He can sort of tap into the vein of what is popular at the time, and that's how their recruitment goes, that's how their publications go, that's how their manga and anime uh, goes and there's there's a, a whole otaku element to the Aum Shinrikyo uh, membership. The fact that um, as sort of talk of Armageddon becomes closer to the forefront of Aum Shinrikyo's teachings, it's around the time when you start to get a lot of apocalyptic elements start starting to play in anime a lot. Uh, especially like Akira comes out and that's a that's sort of a major one, um, or Neon Genesis Evangelion, both sort of end of the world type uh, type movie and series. And it also it does remind me of um, obviously Heaven's Gate a bit with their with their sci fi connection. Um, but yeah, it <laughs> two different strains sort of where Heaven's Heaven's Gate is. Uh, Star Trek. It's it's things are going to be so much better, and Om Shinrikyo is we're the only ones who are going to live. And, yeah. Well, that, well, that's the core of Star Trek. The core of Star Trek is through it's, science and technology yeah. and inner cooperation. The world is going to be a better place, and we're going to usher in exploration to the universe as opposed to it's the it's anti internal, post. It's yeah. the anti post apocalypse. And then obviously, interesting that uh yeah that Heaven's Gate was self destructive and. Um, Shinrikyo was destructive to other people. I mean, I, and they were also killing their own members too. But um, they were more focused on being destructive to, to people outside. And it was also the um, similarity in that both uh, Heaven's Gate and Um Shinrikyo were telling people, you know, you're better than everyone who's not in our group. There was the in-group, out-group mentality of we're we're superior in so many ways. We have these superpowers um, that you can get to that the unenlightened, the regular people, they, they don't understand a very, very hostile, uh, obviously, to, to people who were not in the sect, to the point of um, we need to kill them because they're accruing, accruing bad karma just by existing and not being in the sect. Um, and so killing them is, is a, a mercy in their eyes. That's another point to make about karma, because uh, when a lot of people think of the term karma, uh, they often think, like, okay, so it's this negative spiritual enemy. They, it's this negative spiritual uh, sort of pressure or energy that is put onto you because of the things that you do. Basically, uh, commit a bad deed, well, that's bad karma. Um, Aum Shinrikyo had an understanding of karma that was much more all-encompassing. Basically, by existing in the physical world, it's uh, basically bogging you down. It's weighing you down with negative energy, and that's... uh, that's one of the things that their poa, their sort of killing to save, was supposed to release you from. They're pretty extreme. Um, so with that, yeah, I guess we'll we'll come to an end of episode nine of Sect Zed. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you'll consider following us on Facebook and Twitter, both at Sect Zed, to keep informed about Sect Zed future content. Uh, and in two weeks, we'll be traveling to China for the first... Well, I won't be traveling... Um, in two weeks, we'll be taking a look at China for the first in our two-part series, looking at the God-worshipping society and the Taiping Rebellion. Um, and a, a heads up is there, that's going to be uh, quite violent as well. Um, you can listen to that wherever you find your podcast, iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, we're on YouTube, we're on all of them. Uh, if you really like our show, help it grow, tell a friend or a family member about Sex Ed today. Thanks for listening. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds.
SexEd is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at LEADER, the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates.